Hello there, influential leaders, movers and shakers. This is another episode of The Influential Executive. Today we are speaking with an entrepreneurial coach. Somebody who has had several jobs, started his own business, started several businesses, and since five and a half years, he coaches entrepreneurs in growing their business. And this is a very special man. He has amazing stories to tell and some amazing tips to take along, especially when right now you are not yet an entrepreneur, but you're thinking about it. You're thinking about someday quitting your job and starting your own business. But hey, that's quite a leap. So what are some of the things to bear in mind? And how can you prepare yourself for this big step? That's what we're going to talk about with coach Les Evans. Of course, this episode is sponsored by Earn More, Work Less. We help individuals, companies eliminate stress. Because stress is the biggest problem in today's business world. When companies are stressed, there's tunnel vision, short-term focus, all kinds of poor decisions. So fixing this is the number one priority and it unleashes all kinds of powers you didn't even know exist. Let's earn more work less. For now, enjoy our interview with Les Evans. Okay. Our first question is, besides being a mailman, what other employee experience have you had before you started your own journey? Well, that's a good question. I mean, I had, if I go back, like I'm, I'm kind of half farm boy and half city boy because we had a farm and I also grew up in this city. And so my mother and father coming from a farm and then they went to, to corporate uh, work afterwards. Uh, I grew up with a really strong work ethic. I mean, my father, and he was in the military as well. So you learned how to work. And my first job that I had, I was really into electronics when I was young, like really into uh, not computers, but I was a musician since I was eight. And I used to build my own amplifiers and electronics. And so my first job was working at an electronics company when I was 13 years old. And my father bought me some musical instruments, but by the time I was 14, he said, I'll buy you a drum set. And that's another story because he really made me, I had to play drums for two years on nothing but a rubber pad and chairs to prove that I would pursue this seriously yeah. uh, before he bought me my first drum set at age 11. And then he bought me for my 14th birthday, a professional kit. And he said, that's it. Anything else you want, you have to pay for. So I had a job washing dishes in a Chinese restaurant four days a week to save money to put back into my band. And by the time I was 15, uh, I was already working as a professional musician and, uh, and like a working band. And when I was 16, my brother and I used to pay, I'm sorry, play every weekend. And um, by the time I was 19, and I still have a photograph of it up on my wall here in my office, uh, we were a working band, and this is in 1981. We had $50,000 worth of equipment. I mean, we were a big working band. Uh, but then, unfortunately, I actually damaged my vocal cords, and I, could, I really badly damaged them, and I couldn't sing for like a year and a half. And so my father suggested I get a job working at the telephone company because I there was openings, and I loved electronics. You know, I was already good at that. So I went for the interview and I passed the interview with flying colors. But then I found out I was colorblind and they wouldn't hire me. <laughs> I thought, oh my, like, what am I going to do? And so he said, well, maybe you should go to college and study business, which at that time I had no interest in. But I went and I thought, well, my dad was a marketer uh, for a big company. I thought, well, that at least piques my interest. But unfortunately, I found out many years later that I also have a learning disability. So I only lasted seven months in college. That was it. And that led me to applying for a job at, at the postal service as a mail. <laughs> and I was there for, you know, three or four years, but it was right around that time where as an employee, I spotted that book on in the pharmacy, how to win friends and influence people. And something just went click, you know, my my, I was already an entrepreneur because I'd had my own bands, you know. But at the time, to support myself, uh, you know, I worked at the postal service. But that, something in that just clicked, 
because that book is not really about winning friends and influencing, uh, influencing people. It's a book on character, character. And if you want to become an entrepreneur, there, if there's one thing you need a lot of, it's character. Nice. A lot of uh, uh, mental toughness, I'll call it. And you need, you know, many different skills, people skills, skills that you normally wouldn't have in a job per se. You know. Uh, how do you recognize within yourself whether you have character or whether you have a strong character? Well, that's another good question because um, around the same time, there was a motivational speaker from Canada, which is where I'm from. And he's actually from my hometown of Edmonton, Canada. His name is Brian Tracy. And he has been around for many, many years. And at that time, this is kind of funny, he was running a television commercial and he was selling a program called the 21 Secrets of Success of Self-Made Millionaires for $19.95 <laughs> plus shipping. And ad. So I, I ordered it. And I thought, okay, this, I thought how to win friends and influence people. I thought I was sharing with you before. I thought it was like how to meet women because I was a young single man. I thought, so I'm going to know how to talk to girls and I'm going to be rich. But that course, 21 Secrets of Habits of Millionaires, was all about character. And so to answer your question, Brian Tracy said on that program, he said, do yourself a favor, make a list of these 21 characteristics and rate yourself on a scale of one to 10. 10 meaning you have the highest, uh, <clears throat> highest um, uh, you've mastered that character trait versus one you need to improve. And so I did exactly that. And when I rated myself on his scale, I said, okay, there's a lot of areas I need to work on and improve. And so I've still kept, I still have my original program to this day. And that is gosh, 33 years ago. I've, that's how powerful it was to me. Huge influence. Yeah, that's been a good investment. And Absolutely. One thing that stands out is not only that you saw Brian Tracy, you listened to him, you got his program, you actually went through the program, yep. and here's the real magic. You did as he suggested. Magic formula for success, my friend. <laughs> you know, I'll, I'll take that one step further. I not only did what he suggested, but when I coach people, um, I tell them it's not, it's one thing to read something. It's another thing to understand it. It's another thing to implement. But the last step of mastery is to become that thing, yeah. to become that person. So when I read How to Win Friends and Influence People, I said, I'm going to become this type of person. And, uh, and I've, you know, and of course, it's an ongoing, never ending process of there's no perfection. There's just, you know, constant improvement, which which I love. So yeah, it's amazing. Yeah. And uh, I'm, I'm looking at the photos behind you and it seems like this journey has already brought you into some special places. Yeah. You know, I <clears throat> it's funny because as a I well, I've, I've been a business coach now for about five and a half years and I tripped into it. I never had any ambition to be like a motivational speaker or a coach. I built an investment company. Now, uh, just to touch on professional speaking, the ability to speak in an audience is, is an incredibly powerful gift to have. And I learned how to present to the public to be a professional speaker because uh, when I was building my investment business, I, to me, it never made sense to go see people one-on-one -on -one I was like, this is so time consuming to do one presentation and another. I said, why don't I just present to 100 people at once? You know, and if I have a closing ratio of 10 to 1, I'll get 10 clients for the same amount of work. And so <clears throat> I learned how to do that. And, um, and I sold my business just to my business partner just before I turned 50. And I was doing a lot of nothing for about nine months till I got a phone call from a friend of mine who said, you know what? you should come down. I think you'd make a good coach. And I was like, what's that? <laughs> so, and that has taken me as a business coach. I think I, in all humility, I've worked with probably some of the most powerful uh, and famous people in the world. And it's, it's just been incredible. Yeah, now I want to hear names. <laughs> 
<laughs> well, there's some I can't tell you because of confidentiality agreements, but I've worked with um, one gentleman, for example, was uh, Her Majesty, like Queen Elizabeth, her personal barrister and solicitor, like her personal advisor. I've worked with members of parts of the European royal family. I've worked with movie stars and rock stars, uh, some, a couple of billionaires. Uh, some people very, very highly placed in politics. Um, state attorney general from the state of Nevada in the United States. I just The list is just unbelievable. But, and again, I, I don't want that to sound like an arrogance thing because it's not meant to, people have, the one question I get is people will say, what's that like working with those types of people? And the funny thing is, it's exactly like working with anybody else because it doesn't matter if you're an employee or an entrepreneur, if you're a decent person, you're a decent person. And uh, it was so interesting because the gentleman who was that attorney, I was at his home, he has a huge mansion in London, in the country. And he's a very serious man, very good at what he does. I mean, obviously. Um, <clears throat> but he invited me to stay for dinner one night and he said, we're going to stay for dinner. I'm cooking because I love to cook. And I put, he put on the apron and he broke out some, uh, some red wine. And then he went into a whole series of uh, Monty Python voices and skits. And me being a Canadian and a fan of British humor, I started up and his wife was like, oh, no. So, <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, so you would never expect that when you see somebody in that position. But when you talk to people... They're all the same. And that's, see, to me, Pete, all business is show business. Because I'm a musician, I've always said, my favorite phrase is all business is show business. And if you understand people, you can deal with anyone anywhere in the world. Because, you know, aside from cultural differences and languages, people, the DNA is pretty much the same. So, yeah. Yeah. We're, we all have but, a good heart. We all, we're just doing our best. We yeah. all. We all we don't really know what we're doing. But we're we're gonna We like to pretend we do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But if you yeah, names there's uh well, there's fifty cent up there, the rap star, there's Arnold Schwarzenegger, there's Michael Bean, the actor from Terminator and uh The Abyss and Tombstone and Aliens, there's Vanilla Ice. I mean, I've got just tons of people up in here. So um this is kind of my, my wall of fame. My, this is my man cave, you know? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> but also the most important people, besides the celebs, the most important people are, are right behind me here. Uh, you can't see, I'd have to tip my camera up, but my mother and father and my wife of 30 years and, uh, and my son. So um, those are real accomplishments, you know, to be in the same relationship with the same woman for, and she's still absolutely stunningly beautiful. So uh, that's the real achievement. <clears throat> well done well done well she's got a high pain tolerance she puts up with me <laughs> <laughs> lucky man looking at uh, the employees listening to this thinking you know i i i have that itch i want to start my own business at some point but what what are what are some of the things that you need to sort out for yourself so that you know you're ready to make that leap? Ah, okay. That's a very good question because <clears throat> one of the problems in business is, or, or people transitioning, and I made this mistake myself, so I'm speaking from experience. When I was working with the Postal Service, I had a gentleman, um, a friend of mine actually, he was very successful selling life insurance. And this is 1986, so, you know, because we can talk euro or dollars, but it's the same thing at the end of the day. In 1986, he was earning well over 100000 a year selling uh, insurance. I thought, what? I mean, that was, the, to me, the moon. I mean, it's still a lot of money, don't get me wrong. But uh, I thought, wow. So he recruited me. He said, you know, Les, you're an outgoing guy. I think you'd be great at sales. Uh, and, and so I quit my job. No, I had a young baby at the time. And I just left because I was so ambitious. I had ambition and drive. And within six months, I was going completely and utterly broke because I had no skill sets 
for selling. So before you transition into a field, you need to make sure, <clears throat> I beg your pardon, that you can acquire those skill sets or get a coach and mentor who can, can train you up. What happened to me was because I was failing so miserably, back then you never heard of coaches and mentors. I mean, today that's a very common thing. I actually asked around to find someone to train me and I got introduced to a gentleman who was of all things a door-to-door -door vacuum cleaner salesman. Uh, and you know, your first thought of, of you know, what kind of person is that, you, all the stereotypes come to mind. Somebody who is pushy, probably has bad breath, uh, you know, dresses poorly. But when I met this gentleman, he was the exact opposite. He was a very, uh, very low key, friendly man, very warm, married to the same woman for 28 years. He was driving in that time, and that was 86, 87. He was driving the top of the line Jaguar motor car. He was earning, I think, 130,000 a year because he was selling 50 vacuums a month. And he was a very classy, elegant, and I, elegant man. And I begged him, literally begged him to teach me how to sell. And uh, so he said, well, I'm not selling vacuum cleaners anymore. And you see, to, you have to understand to me, I, I got a promotion at the post office. I was, I was wearing a suit. And now I thought, oh my gosh, I'm going to go door to door. That was the most humiliating, like to me, the most disgraceful fall. Because I just thought, a door-to-door -door salesman has no status, you know, that's such a, it's not like being a doctor or something. <laughs> and to make a long story short, he said, well, if you want to come, I'll teach you how to sell, but we're going to sell pots and pans door-to-door. -door. Like a very expensive cookware. And that was my first entre real entrepreneurial journey, learning a skill to be an entrepreneur. And he was so good when I joined this organization, there was 2,500 salespeople worldwide. I was 2,501, uh, but within three months, I was number three in the company and he was number two. Whoa. Yeah, and that is, for your listeners, the power of having the right coach or mentor. And the key to having the right coach or mentor is to, is to work with somebody who's actually had the achievements. Unfortunately, today, and this troubles me. I saw, I see a lot of people positioning themselves as coaches and mentors. And I go, well, what have you achieved before you became a coach and mentor? And I'm not saying you have to be the greatest expert in the world, but you need to know more than the person that you're coaching. You know, when I got asked to be a coach, I mean, I built a multi, multi million dollar investment company. We were trading a hundred million dollars a day I brought in over a thousand clients myself, so I know a thing or two about business and getting clients. And uh, so that's the most important distinction. And also, as Steve Jobs once said, the key is not to do what you love, but to find the love in what you do. So you can pick an area of interest because when you're an entrepreneur, it is not easy. There's a lot. If you think it's tough being an employee, <laughs> it's difficult being an entrepreneur. The trade off is you are the boss, but you're also going to have to do a lot of things you don't like to do at first, as with anything. Um, but when you go through that process, you are going to grow tremendously. Great thing about being an entrepreneur is you know you 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 can't be made obsolete. <laughs> so, your job cannot be made redundant. And if you, particularly if you learn the skill of selling, which I believe everyone should do, uh, selling is the most noble profession in the world, in my opinion, because until somebody sells something, all the production stops. I don't care if you're selling flowers or automobiles, nothing gets sold without a salesperson behind it. So it's a very, very noble profession. Salespeople create employment. Yeah. Yeah, and it, it requires a certain level of vulnerability in order to help another person. And I think that that's the toughest part for most people. You know, you, what you said is exactly right. Uh, many people have the wrong um, impression of what it takes to be a great salesperson. It's more empathy than anything. Selling is, selling is helping people get what they want and helping them get their get out of their own way 
because what happens a lot of times in selling people have limiting beliefs and there's two kinds of limiting beliefs is number one they'll have uh what i call um kind of a stereotype like they'll they'll say well you know it's like saying all lawyers are slimy or something that's called a global belief in other words it's a very broad paintbrush so they look at selling the wrong way uh but or or they'll say well you know uh they might have a limiting belief that's that's good for somebody else but it's not for me and i can give you an example of that the very first time i bought or I had a good friend uh, he said you should buy better dress shoes now my father always had me polish my shoes because he was from the military <laughs> and he really instilled that into me, my head that no matter it doesn't if your shoes are expensive or not you look after them and always have your shoes shine but my friend said you know you should you should step up i think it's time you started wearing shoes that cost like $500 instead of $100 so that's quite a jump you know you say like 100 euro to 500 euro and i i felt uncomfortable with that like my self worth would not allow me i said that's fine for you but that's not fine for me which is ridiculous this was just a limiting belief and so he being a great salesperson helped me over, i wanted them i just didn't feel worthy so his job was just to help me get out of my own way to get the shoes that i wanted and to feel worthy about it and i thought there it, like that is a very very noble thing to do to help somebody feel that they deserve that that product because i still have those shoes to this day they're 16 years old <laughs> you know and they still look fantastic so he did me a tremendous favor yeah. so that uh if you can reframe how you look at things your perspective selling yeah. is a noble profession indeed and it's like the tough thing is you you help somebody to get to the other side yep. but they don't know what the other side is like because they haven't experienced it yet all they know Correct. is where they are right now and it's always safer more comfortable to stay here yes. then on the other side all kinds of things happen like also internally with how you yes. feel your emotions that you could have never guessed because my Absolutely. guess is when you were wearing those $500 shoes you felt different I, it absolutely different it, they changed my life in fact as a coach one of the things i challenge people to do is go out and and challenge yourself like that i <laughs> this is silly but one of my friends just not too long ago a few months ago we were doing a seminar event we're spe and he came down uh to the room and we're just standing together talking having our morning coffee and i said good I said, you smell great you know <laughs> i said you're not my type but you smell like what are you wearing and he said oh i have this special soap that i buy i said well I said, it's amazing where do i get it he says oh you can't get it he didn't want me to know the secret and i said well what is it he said it's tom ford you know the brand tom ford he said it's called oud oudwood soap i said i've never even heard of that he goes yeah well it's a hundred dollars for one bar of soap and i went i was like what a hundred dollars that's insane <laughs> for a, i could go to walmart you know or you to buy a hundred bars of soap but but it, you know what alexander it got me so curious because i said well why do i have a why do i have a limiting belief about a hundred dollar bar of soap because you know of course when we're growing up your mother says don't waste money cuz the kids are starving in africa you know you always get that speech yeah. and so we get limiting beliefs um so to make a long story short i was in downtown toronto and and it is, that soap is hard to find you can't and it really is $100 that was a, i just about had a heart attack so i was down for a meeting i went to a a high end store and i asked them i said do you have tom ford oudwood soap and they said yes we do it's right over here sir and i looked at the price and in canada here it was $88 plus tax so $100 i said good grief he wasn't kidding it's 100 and i said i just can't i can't do it i can't bring my... and i was fighting with myself which is ridiculous and i thought you know what that does it that i've got to i got to <laughs> I just have to put because if I can't do that, if I'm a coach trying to push somebody against their limiting belief, because it's a self-worth issue, right? Yeah. It's like, 
uh, it's like saying to my friend, well, uh, you're worth the hundred dollars. So, but I'm not, that's what I was really saying to myself. Uh, you're worth it, but I am not. See, if you don't respect yourself, you can't expect others to respect you. And so I thought I need, I need to do this just because I'm fighting it. So I went to, I said, I'll take it. And she rang the lady assistant, uh, rang it through the till. And she goes, Oh, she goes, there's been a price change. And I thought, Oh no, don't, don't tell me it's like 125. <laughs> and she goes, no, actually uh, there's a huge sale here. So you can get two of these bars of soap tax included for a hundred dollars. I said, okay, now I'm definitely. <laughs> 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 and so I know that's a little bit of a silly story, but it's, it's a really good sales lesson for somebody about over. And by the way, I still have the second bar because that stuff lasts forever and it smells amazing. <laughs> so, <laughs> that is very cool. I love that story. It, it's, uh, it really, you have to challenge yourself to get beyond your limiting beliefs. And um, when you come from a humble background, like most of us do, you think something like that is absurd because when you grow up on a farm, you have, you know, a plain old bar of soap. So you would think it's not practical. And, and that's true. But when it's a self-worth issue, it's, you'd be surprised at how often people get stuck you know, it's like trying to go from, as I was at the Postal Service, I was making uh, just over $40,000 a year, which in those days was good money. And to me, to hit $100,000 was like, oh, if I could just do that. And so the first time I hit $100,000, I was like, oh, well, that wasn't a very big deal. And then there was a weekend I earned over 100000 and I thought, well, I thought, you know, I don't know what I was expecting, fireworks or, or girls dancing. I had no idea. I kind of, you know, it's like a friend of mine who's a professional golfer. The first time he hit a hole in one, he said it was so disappointing because there wasn't any fireworks or anything. So we, it's so much of it is in our minds that we build up. And when you get there, you realize there was nothing there except yourself stopping yourself. Yeah. The crazy thing is that already by now, it's scientifically proven that our thoughts create. That Absolutely. We send out energy and that comes back to us. And if mm -hmm. we keep thinking the same thoughts, we keep getting the same results. So I bet that as a coach, more than anything, what you do is you figure out how people speak to themselves. Uh, it, how they speak to themselves and how they look at themselves. See, to me, I, like, I, I have to wear glasses. I can't wear contact lenses. So one of, one of my, I'm kind of decided to uh, do an Elton John. So I have, my glasses are all custom. So this is the only pair of these glasses in the world. So what I, I use my eyeglasses as a metaphor because I said, if you see the world the way, if you take, look through, like when you wear glasses, if you exchange glasses with somebody else, it, the world looks very different because your perspective is different. So as a coach, yeah, from a mindset standpoint, quite a what off, often I'll do is I'll say, I'm going to show you how I see the world and how I see you. Because, and that's why I have coaches that are good friends of mine. We coach each other because they come from different backgrounds and they can see. Th in fact, that's how I got into coaching. One of my good friends said, you know what? You'd make a great coach. That was never on my radar. So to your listeners, uh, if you're working for somebody else and you life taps you on the shoulder sometimes and says, hey, if you have friends saying to you, you know what, you'd be really good at this. Did you ever think of doing that? That's life tapping you on the shoulder because you probably have the talent to do it. That's just a piece of advice for you there. I love it. And that's what I came to understand is your calling. No, and people yeah. say, this is my calling to do that. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean that a magical voice out of the heavens appeared and said, hey, Alexander, can you please start this company? It always comes through somebody else. When another yeah. person says, hey, would you like to do this? That's your calling. That's your cue. That's where you, you know what? It. That's a very, very good point. I, I read uh, just a couple months ago a quote by Mark Cuban, the billionaire. And he said, there's two things, your purpose and your path, or no, your passion, forgive me, your passion and your path. 
And I, I said, I totally get that. See, my passion was, from being a young boy was to become a professional musician, which I did. And I even have a great songwriting award, which I'm really, really proud of. But it wasn't my path. See, it was my passion and I still love to play music. I love to sing and play music. But your path is what you find yourself naturally doing without thinking. See, to become a rock star, like a real rock star, everybody wants to be a rock star in life. Like you can be a rock star doctor, you can be a rock star business person. You know, it just means you're the best at what you do. But I've worked with real life rock stars and what you don't realize is it takes about 10 years of practicing 10 hours a day to become a rock star. You can't, if you only practice one or two hours a day, you will never be a rock star. So it's, it's not 10,000 hours. It's more like 30,000 hours. So for me, I found myself, like I said, when I got into this path of reading, I found myself doing that naturally without even thinking. So I would read and study three, four, five hours a day. In fact, still to this day, I probably spend at least two hours a day. So I'm well past 30,000 hours now. But that turned out to be my path, even though my passion was over here. And it turns out I have tremendous gifts in that ability. So uh, very blessed. But everybody has gifts. It's yeah. just having the courage to chase after them. I, I say that talent, um, talent is a God-given feeling or an inclination or a longing like you said you long to do something but that's where the bargain with god ends you have to get to work after that <laughs> it's like yeah. you know that's yeah. just my personal opinion and i've found usually if you have a longing and you find yourself doing something naturally that seems to come more easily to you that's probably what you're going to be great at it and usually means that you have the you have the genetics for it you know, the voice or, or the, maybe the steady hands to be an artist or a surgeon, perhaps, or whatever the case is. Yeah. One thing that uh, changed a lot, a lot of things for me over the past, uh, it's actually in the past years when I came to understand that my path, so the path that I'm supposed to walk, is also the path of least resistance. <laughs> it's also that which comes naturally, that which I'm asked to do. Yep. That's what I love, which I love doing. And so walking your path more than anything means to let go and stop doing all those other things you once thought were necessary. It was Absolutely. a 180 degree turn in the way I experienced my growth and the growth of my business. You, what you said is, I'm getting, I'm getting goosebumps from that. <laughs> And you know what? The, the, I'll tell you why. The longer you do that, in other words, when you get out of your own way and, and just follow that path, uh, the more you will find that life will correct you when you get off of it. And I can give you a perfect example. Um, the only trade that I was good at from, from a trade standpoint was doing electrical work, but I'm colorblind, so I could never get certified to do it. So, okay, so that door is closed. Uh, I carpentry, forget it. <laughs> you know? uh, my father-in-law is brilliant at as a tradesman and make, make, makes a very good living at it. But this is how funny it is. If I, my wife is, has a wonderful green thumb, like she's so good at decorating and gardening and all these things. And, you know, being the man, I want to go out and turn on the lawnmower and go cut the grass, right? The minute I approach the lawnmower, these days, or do anything mechanical, everything goes wrong. Like instantly goes wrong. And I'm going, I go, okay, I'm listening. <laughs> it literally, I just, I, so I stay away from all of that stuff. I only stick to what I do. And that's the key to being great is a lot of people try to overcome their weaknesses. I prefer to surround myself with people who make up for my weaknesses. And then I just stick to what I do the best. Just just because everything falls apart. The only if I get off a track, everything else starts falling apart. So I just stick to what I do best. It, it's so liberating once you start being honest about that. Once mm -hmm. people ask you to do something and you can just say, like, no, I'm really not going to do that. Like, yeah, this is my thing. This is what I do. This is yep. what I do all the time. That thing you're asking me, I'm not the right person. 
And yep. what typically happens is at first you may feel uh, a little bit weird about turning somebody down or saying no. But what yeah. happens is that person will understand who you are and they say, oh, if you want to do more of that, I, I have something else for you. I'm going to tell you about this other project. And before you know it, there's, there's this dream project waiting for you because mm -hmm. you said no to the other thing. Yeah. And, and the thing too is, as I um, say many times, skills pay the bills. The more highly skilled you are at what you do, the more money you make. It's just, it's just that simple. I mean, when you commit to being the very best, that doesn't mean perfect. That means the, being the best you that you can be at what you do. So in other words, you're, one thing I don't like is when people say, oh, you have unlimited potential. I go, well, no, that's not true because there's limits to your strength and health and time and money. But that's not the issue. The issue is, are you pushing yourself to your potential? See, because I've worked with, in fact, I have up here, where is Bruni Serin? He's an Olympic gold medalist. He's just over here. I work with Bruni. And the one thing about working with Olympic gold medalists is they're wonderful to work for as a coach. Because they say, coach, what do I need to do? And you'll say, this, this, and this, A, B, C, one, two, three. And they go, okay. And they go do it. Because they're used to pushing themselves to their potential. See, he, can't, he can only run so fast. But the key is to run as fast as he can. And he did. And that's why he's a gold medalist. Most of us don't run to our potential. If we did, we'd be shocked. This is why, like in the last five, six years, as a coach and speaker, I push myself to exhaustion, literally, because I had a professional foot. When I say football, I don't mean soccer. I, in North America, we mean like football. You mean hand uh, egg. Yeah. Yeah. Like in the NFL. So I had a, a Canadian championship football uh, player once as a favor to a friend of mine, sit me down for lunch and coach me. Cause I was, this is when I was going broke selling insurance <laughs> And I was very frustrated and I really wanted to give up. And he was this, in Canada, we call it the Grey Cup. That's like our national championship for football. He was a six-time champion. And that was the first celebrity I'd really ever met. And he gave me a good lesson. He said, you know, everybody wants to be a champion. But he said, you know what, you know what it takes to be a champion? And I said, no, I'd love to learn. He goes, he goes it's the blood in the mud. And the mud and the blood. And I said, well, what does that mean? He goes, well, I'm a big guy, but there's guys who wear, weigh 15, 20 kilos more than me. You think it doesn't hurt when we get hit and we get our teeth knocked out. We get our ribs broken. You get slammed in the ground so hard. You get mud shoved so far up that by the time you blow it out of your nose, you're just bleeding and you stink and you sweat and everything in your body tells you to stay down, but that's not how you win. You have to get up. And the same thing happens and you have to get up. And the other guy who your, your opponent is has to get up. And he said, finally, your opponent decides to not get up that last time and you get up and that's how you win. And I was like, he goes, you just have to get up one more time than the other guy. But in the meantime, it's the mud and the blood and you stink and you sweat. Yeah. And so I thought, you know, that stayed with me. He said that to me when I was 26 and that was 30 years ago. So it, it stayed with me. And one time I saw the musician Sting, you know, uh, on a, from the police, you know, from years ago on yeah. a television interview. And of course, he's wealthy beyond belief and super famous. And the interviewer said, asked him a question. He said, what's the, what's the most surprising thing about being rich and famous that you find today now that you're so successful? And Sting thought about it. He says, you know, the most surprising thing is that I still have to sweat when I go to work. <laughs> yeah. 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 Even though you're rich and famous, you still have to sweat. So. <laughs> and I never forgot that. So champions, people who are at the best at what they do, they do what I was told to do, which is play like every game is the last day of your life because it just might be. So every time I'm on a stage or in a coaching session, I play till I'm exhausted. And I do mean literally exhausted because then you know you've given everything you've, you have. See, people are always trying to hold back a little. You know, they're always trying to hold back. And is when you hold back that 10%, that's the 10% that's going to make you the champion. That's what's going to make you win. Yeah.
Yeah, and it, it blocks you, it takes you out of the moment, because what you need is presence. What you need is to be fully present in this bubble yep. and just go for it with unlimited belief in yourself and, and also trust yep. that whatever comes out is going to be not perfect. It's going to be good enough. And the next time is going to be even better. That's right. You're a hundred, you're a hundred percent right. And the thing you'll find, like when you, if you speak to successful people in all different types of fields, right? You're, the one thing they all have in common is they, they have what I call that Indiana Jones moment. Uh, what is it from uh, the last crusade where he has to step across the, the, the chasm, you know, and he can't see, he, he's supposed to have faith that something's there on the other side, but he can't see that there's that, that bridge that's made out of rock because his perspective, his perspective, the way he's looking at it, he can't see it. So every person who's successful gets to a point in their life at least one time where they have to put that foot forward knowing that there's no safety net there. And you have, the faith is not, the faith in the belief is that you can believe that you can come, no matter what happens, that you can become resourceful enough to deal with whatever happens. And it's when you do that, that your perspective shifts because now you've shifted from who you are to what your destiny is going to be. And boom, there's, there's the rock appears and you're on solid ground. Yeah. So I love that. That's the point where you, where you grow this trust in yourself, knowing that, you know, whatever comes my way, I'm going to find a way out. And once yep. you have that belief, now you can really fly. Now you lose so much of the fears and the limits. Yes. You can just go because, you know, I'm, whatever happens, I will improvise my way out of it. You know, you, you just reminded me of something. I, I always said, um, when, when, the, when, the, when the chips are down, as the expression says, you get very, very resourceful. And when I would speak at some seminars, I would ask people for a paperclip. I'd say, does anybody have a paperclip here? And so I'd pull out a paperclip and I'd go, how much is this worth? And it's, well, it's nothing. It's worth, you know, one penny. You know, it's worthless. I said, right, we're in a room full of a thousand people. I'll throw it in the floor. And nobody's going to pick it up because it's worthless. But I said, if I go into a maximum security prison and I throw it into a prison cell, it will be priceless. <laughs> Because the prisoners in there, they have nothing. And so everything becomes an asset. So it's learning as an entrepreneur, we learn to look at things as assets. We look and say, what do I have? What do I have? What do I have? And two powerful questions I learned a long time ago is not to ask yourself how to do something because that's disempowering. A how question is what I call an endless loop question. You'll go, how do you do that? I don't know. How do I do that? But if you replace that question with two other questions and you say, okay, I want to do this. So what do I need to do? What do I need to do? And then who do I need? Whose help do I need? Who can I go to? And you can, you can build almost anything or create anything with those questions, starting from scratch. What do I want to do? Who do I need for the team? Because you're going to need a team. Every, there's no... The only thing better than one star is a superstar team. That's how you get there. You're going to need a team to help you. You can't, there's just no other way. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's true. And uh, that, that brought me, brings me to the realization how important it is also to have a network of peers. You know, other people are on a similar path. And also they feel that I'm on this journey and I'm learning, I'm growing. And my old surroundings, my old colleagues, my old friends, they don't really get me anymore. No. They, they are where they were, and, but I'm over here now. And so having these people around you as your team, as your partners, as people who can introduce you places, that's massive. So it's very much about who you know as well. Uh, yes. And you need absolutely like a, a support of like-minded people. And, and the interesting thing is, you know, your friends and sometimes family, once you start to pull away from their kind of lifestyle, like if they're all employees working for something and you go on an entrepreneurial journey, and I think this is funny because I did that many years ago 
And one of my good friends, his mom and dad were saying, what is it with Les? He never settles down. He's never doing the same thing twice. You know, he's always got this business or that business. And they looked at it as a negative. Today, we call that a serial entrepreneur. <laughs> you know, so if the mentality is just, is just different. So, you know, funny enough, because, um, and this came up when I was in Amsterdam speaking, a question that I get from many people, which is like, well, in, in Australia, they call it a tall poppy syndrome. Like you're too big for you're standing out too much in uh, Norway. They call it uh, uh, Jent, Jentelovan. There's some, Jent, it's like a philosophy. It's like, don't, don't think you're better than anybody, but we have that in Canada too. It's like the, the only place I don't think they have that is maybe the United States. Yeah. They're not like that. There, they're like, you go for it. And so the question I would get for people all the time was like, well, what about if my friends and family start criticizing me? You know, that you're getting too big, you know? And I said, well, that's kind of silly because we're coming into spring, you know, and the flowers are starting to bloom. And you could never imagine one flower shouting at the next flower saying, hey, don't, don't bloom too brightly because you're making the rest of us look bad. You know, so my my philosophy, and it's just my personal spiritual philosophy, is that we're human beings. We're a lot like flowers, and it is our job to bloom to the best of our ability and not worry about somebody else's. So if I get that kind of criticism, I just say, listen, I have to answer to the big guy upstairs for my life, and, and I'm just going to focus on that, and you need to answer for yours, so you do whatever. You know, that's not my responsibility, what you think. I have to do, and if I, I don't think people become better. The only way I think you can become better is better in character and better as a person. But uh, a person who is famous or wealthy is not better. Uh, like, I don't look at them as better unless their character is better. Because I've met, you know, some really wealthy people who are not good people. So to me, that's the measuring stick. Anyways, yeah. yeah. I like it. I like it. <laughs> we, we have a few minutes left and I want to be respectful of your time. I do want to also introduce you to a special element in, uh, in the interviews and that is a rapid fire question round. Okay. Are you ready? I, I hope so. Hold it. I'll just <laughs> get a glass of water. <laughs> and, uh, I'm going to shoot a series of short questions uh, at you. I'm going to sh start just with single words. And your challenge is to answer by one word. Oh, okay. Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll do my best. <laughs> association game. Let, let go of the prefrontal cortex. Whatever comes up in your mind, shout. First word. Uh, okay. Leader. Oh, boy. I got so many things going in my mind. Lee Iacocca. Cool. Freedom. Music. Team. Success. Spirituality. Necessary. Free time. Precious. Sports. Respect. Inspiration. My wife. Dream. Big. Entrepreneur. What's the, what's the word I'm looking for? Visionary. Oh, cool. Selling. Noble. Some short questions. First of all, what is the number one self-help book for you personally? How to win friends and influence people. Bar none. Yeah, I thought so. What's currently on top of your bucket list? <sighs> currently on top. Okay, I'll just say it. It's a brand new seminar series that I'm putting together. Yeah that's themed around music oh wow 
yeah, everything it's it's all bi- it's all business training and entrepreneurial training. But as I was saying before, to, if you understand show business, you'll be very successful in business. Okay, because all business, if you're dealing with people instead of robots, if you put on a show because you're dealing with people, show entertainers understand people really, really well. And your physiology and your tonality and the performance you put on, whether you're dealing as a leader, as a team leader, if you're selling, if you're dealing with customers, if you put on a great show, you're going to have tons of business because the people, reason people love show business is show business people make you feel something. And if you're great at making people feel, people will crawl over broken glass to buy feelings. That is the biggest thing I learned as an entertainer. If you can make people feel differently, like people say, how do I differentiate? Easy, make them feel something. Don't give them facts and figures. Like you said, bypass the neocortex right (laughs) up here. This is the thing that talks you out of the sale. (laughs) People, I mean, why do you go to the movies? To feel something. Why do you fall in love? To feel something. We do everything for feelings. So I tell people, if you can deliver feelings, and put on a show. We're, we're always too worried about offending somebody or, or, or being too loud. I said, well, that's ridiculous. I'm not going to apologize for who I am. And if you don't like it, that's fine. Because you're always going to have people that resonate with you. And you're going to have people that you repel. And that's great. Because you don't want those clients anyways. Yeah. So <laughs> there's my answer. Indeed. Oh, that's good. That's good. What is your favorite spare time hobby? Mm, play music yeah yeah absolutely nice most inspirational movie oh boy that's a tough one most inspirational movie gosh you know that's really difficult because and i'll tell you why my son is a filmmaker like he, he makes feature films literally like the kind that he sells he does this for a living and so between he and I, we have about 3,000 movies in our library. <laughs> so I, I honestly, I'm, I don't know which one I could tell you. Because it's just, so, that actually, okay, I can throw out one that has a great speech. Uh, the Green Lantern, funny enough. The Green Lantern. Yeah, and I'll tell you why. That's a little bit of an obscure movie. Uh, but there is a great speech on fear on there. It's about 20 to 25 minutes into the movie. One of the best speeches I've ever heard on fear because the speech given is something to the effect, Alexander, that fear makes our dreams small. And when, you, when you're afraid, you don't dream big. And one of, one of the things I learned many years ago when I was going through a tough time is that if you're struggling, you're not dreaming big enough. You're literally not dreaming big enough. Like if, you, if you've made a million dollars and lost a million dollars, to dream about making another million is not a big enough dream to get you back. You have to dream like, I, I wanna go for 20 million or whatever the case is. And the reason I say this is Olympic athletes have that problem. They work for years to win the gold. And the minute they win the gold, they get very, very depressed. Because it's like, now what? So this is the time to dream even bigger. And that is the thing that will pull people, out of, pull people out of depression or being frustrated or in a funk. It's like, you're not dream, dreaming big enough. You have to dream. And when I say dream, I do mean dream. I don't mean being a visionary. That comes later. But just like a child, having a great big dream. So to answer your question, like on my bucket list, I've, I've built in the process of building like extraordinary experiences with business coaching, but revolving around music and having rock stars come in for this because rock stars are tremendous business people. They're great entertainers. It's show business, show business. So that's something I'm really, really excited about. So. Oh, you made me excited as well. Oh, it's going to, it's going to be really, really cool. So <laughs> it's taken me, uh, I just, it took me a while to get to the point where I felt I could do it, funny enough. Yeah. So, well, but I know I can do it now because I've worked with plenty of rock stars and you just find out at the end of the day, the real professionals are amazing people. Great conversations, you know. 
exciting cool. stuff. It's going to be yeah. good. Yeah, it's going to be really exciting. <laughs> so. Where where can people find you, listeners, right now, and say, "Hey, this uh, Les Evans, Coach Les, he knows what he's talking about, and he man, he, he struck a chord with me." Oh, well, hopefully, I thank you. you have a new program coming out soon, and you know what what can people do to start their journey with you by their side? Well, I mean, if you want to just get a hold of me and talk about whether you're looking for a coach or something, I don't take on very many private clients because I'm very, very fussy with that. And, and I'll tell you why. Because to be a great coach is about a great relationship. Uh, I have to know that I have the right skills to help you. If I, if I don't have the right tools to help you, I will send you to somebody else who I believe. That's integrity in business. That's a necessity. I um. You can probably see them behind me. I have a gold record and a platinum record back there. I learned something years ago about creating hit music is you have to work with people who can create hits. So I won't, you can be a great person. You know, it's like a marriage. You could be a great woman. I could be a great guy. But the question is, are we great together? So I take people on based on that. So I'm pretty, uh, it's not that I'm fussy. I just want to make sure it's the right relationship. Because you're going to have to push me and because it's a real, it is really like a relationship back and forth. So, um, but you can find me on Facebook. It's just uh, Les Evans official, you know, L E with the capitals. Uh, you can find me on there. I'm at uh, Twitter at I am Les Evans. You can message me on Instagram. Same thing at I am Les Evans. And yeah, what, what I did just recently as kind of an exercise is I built an online uh, course called rock your biz and i made it very very inexpensive because even hiring me as a coach for a day is thousands of dollars but i was sitting back after the past five years looking at what i noticed there were gaps and for your listeners by the way if you want to be an entrepreneur there you, we are surrounded in a sea of opportunities and see what entrepreneurs do average people deal with things they hate every day. Like they complain about this and they complain about this. You know, why doesn't somebody fix this? Why doesn't somebody do that? Right? Yeah. Entrepreneurs have situational awareness. They go, Hey, wait a second. If I fix that, I'm going to get a lot of customers. And we, we, talk, we hear about Uber all the time, right? Uber was started by somebody who finally got fed up enough to fix the problem with taxis. Yeah. That's it. That's the whole business model. <laughs> So we are surrounded with that. So as a coach and speaker, and I've been in this industry long enough, I looked around at what I saw was, I looked at two things. What, when I was coaching business people, and some of my students have got literally, my best coaching students went from doing uh, $25,000 contracts to $20 million contracts. I mean, just astronomical growth. And I looked at what was I doing with them? What was the common denominator in everyone that I coached specifically? What did I coach them on that made the difference? And then I, so that was number one thing. I was like, what's working? And then I said, what's wrong with this industry? In other words, the coaching and motivational industry, where do things suck? Because if you want to look for opportunities, you look at what your competition is doing well, and then find out where they're doing things badly. And I identified probably eight or nine areas where people are weak as entrepreneurs. So I'll, I'll give you a quick example that's on Rock Your Biz. A lot of people don't know this, but if you'd ask people, the biggest hedge funds in the world, what's the secret to creating the biggest hedge funds in the world? And people will tell you, oh, um, it's getting the best advisors, getting the best talent, getting the best algorithms, picking the right stocks for the portfolio. And it's, uh, the answer to that is actually zero. That's none of them. The thing that makes head funds so successful is they have the best philosophy. Every great business has a great vision. I call it trans uh, transcendent or poetic purpose. In other words, they have a massive vision of how they're gonna change the world, but they have a very, very specific philosophy. And that philosophy drives everything. It drives your brand and et cetera, et cetera. And it's, re it's actually not that difficult to understand because it's one of the things I explained. So I had a coach of mine, he goes, 
you got all this knowledge. How come you haven't recorded it? So I said, okay, I'm going to, I'll put together a, a course and they were saying, you should sell it for 5,000. I said, well, I don't want to sell it for 5,000. I want people to be able to afford it. So I made it 497 US and I was simply going to make eight modules, but it's turned into like this behemoth that'll have 12 modules. And I think there's already 20 hours of coaching <coughs> content on there. Mm. So I, I think I send you the website link. Uh, people can go take a look at it if they're interested in it, but it's got, it's, it is so jam packed. I talk about starting with your philosophy, how to build a real brand because a brand is not a logo, not even close. And I give case studies and examples and there's notes in there. There's videos, there is audios. I teach everything. I go from marketing, branding, advertising, sales. I mean, I cover the gamut in this thing. And it's all super, super, super concentrated information. The thing that, what I wasn't expecting is I only opened it up to about 20 people because I just wanted to test the feedback. And the two words that are coming back more than anything, Alexander, are number one, mind-blowing, because they're like, oh my gosh, we never expected this. Because I don't, uh, there are a lot of speakers out there that will take one subject and they'll talk about it for an hour. That's not me. I'll, I'll put 20 things in one hour. So the second comment that's come out is they're like, there's so much stuff in here. We have to listen to each one of these modules like three, four, five times over just to get the thing. So for me, it was just a passion project. I didn't expect to sell a ton of it because I said, I need to record this information to build the material for my live events. And that's the whole purpose of it. So if you, re if you really want to bargain and pay literally one tenth of what it costs to hire for me <laughs> for a day, you'll get a ton. There's literally like three days worth of content on there. Incredible. So in cool. all humility. So yeah. So the, it's like rockyourbiz.podia.com. You'll have the link. I know you've got the link so they can have a look at it. And uh, I'll include it in the show notes so that it's easy to find. Yep. So, and um, there you go. In the meantime, we're working on building up these live events and we're putting together all the marketing and the materials for that, which will be fun. Um, it's cool. I've done a lot of events for other speakers and other coaches. This is going to be fun because this is 100% original stuff. Every speaker, you can hear certain things from speakers and trainers that are universal because there are universal success principles. What I've done differently is everything that I teach is from firsthand knowledge. Every story you'll ever hear from me is from firsthand knowledge. I don't tell makeup stories. I don't have to tell somebody else's stories. I have done everything, every single thing that I coach on and teach and train on, I've done personally. And I've taught others to do personally and had great success. That's why I have a track record that very few coaches have. And that part I'm very proud of. And also very humbled by. It's a great, um, it's an amazing feeling. And if I did, if some farm kid from Hay Lakes, Alberta can do it, so can you. <laughs> That's right. That's right. So can you. I love it. Thank you for this wonderful conversation. You're welcome. Time flew by. That's a great sign. When time gets distorted, it means you were in a state of flow together. And I uh, very much appreciated it. I know that our audience will love this conversation as well. All of the links you mentioned, I'm going to include them in the show notes so that it's easy for everybody to find you, to stay connected. Because and you post a lot on social media as well. So there's every now and then, there's Les Evans popping up with something smart to say. Yep. Actually, on my Facebook, if you want some free training, there's you dig through my videos. I've got several little tidbits on there, you know, eight, 10 minute videos where you can learn a ton from. And there's no, there's no sales pitch to any of this. It's just, if you, if you wanna learn it, be my guest. I love sharing that stuff, I, I really do. I love helping people. It's just, uh, why not? I, I paid the price for it, so you might as well benefit. <laughs> amazing, amazing. Thank you so much. Thank you for sharing your wisdom. Thank you for sharing your time. I love this conversation. And um, we're going to do some editing, make a really nice episode out of it. Of course, I'm going to let you know when it's ready. And you can start cool. promoting it. Tell people all about it. 
Thank you. It's been, it's been fun. I really, really enjoyed it. And you asked some great questions there. So. Uh, happy to hear that. Yeah, <laughs> that was very good. A lot of very enjoyable, very pleasurable to do so. I hope that was a great start of the day and you are ready to rock your day. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. All right, my friend, thank you very much. So pleasure meeting you and um, yeah, stay in touch by all means. For sure. Will do. Yeah. Pleasure meeting you too. And uh, have a wonderful day. I'm going yeah, to you touch. And that was Coach Les Evans. Such a wonderful conversation. He has so many stories to tell. And this way you see the power of being a good storyteller because I was hanging by his lips and I had, I had a great time having this conversation and, and speaking with him. I have a page full of notes here, all kinds of yeah, tips and tidbits, things that I picked up. And for you, if you're in a job right now thinking about becoming an entrepreneur, I hope that Les gave you some, some insight into what it means in reality. What the real day-to-day -day is like, what's going on in your mind, the type of challenges you will be faced with, and of course also all the beauty and the payoff of walking your own path. Really doing what you were designed to do, what you were put on this planet for. The episode was sponsored by Earn More, Work Less. We help eliminate stress, we help optimize your capabilities. Your mind is your number one tool. So the way you use your mind to achieve your goals, to get what you want, that is the skill of all skills. That's what I specialize in. On earnmoreworkless.com slash blog, you can read all kinds of articles. You can find other podcasts that help you do exactly that. Achieve more with less resources. To stay in touch with Les Evans, you heard him. He's on Facebook. Les Evans on Twitter, that is at I am Les Evans and also on Instagram. And finally, his course, Rock Your Biz. It sounds amazing. I'm definitely going to check it out and I'm going to make sure that the link is also in the show notes. That's it for now. I wish you a beautiful day. Let's all go out and rock our day.